All right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Trey. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the studio in Fairfax City. We're very humble and grateful that Trey again accepted our invitation to our show. Trey, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. Happy to hey, be here. Roll. Same here. Uh, Trey, let's go back to the beginning of your life. Were you born like in a musical family? I mean, how were you when you perhaps began taking, I don't know, piano lessons, guitar lessons? Uh, you know, I wasn't... It was, it, I wasn't really a musical family. My my mother's father played guitar and uh, uh, harmonica, like old um, old school American folk music and 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 old school country music, like like yeah. Hank Williams, uh, Charlie Pride, this stuff. Uh, but other than that, my my parents aren't musicians. My sister isn't a musician. Nobody in my family, other than that, was a musician. I just was drawn to it when I saw people uh you know friends playing piano or violin I just I wanted to do that yeah were you in a band in high school uh and by, by the time high school came around yeah I played piano for a lot as a kid and then violin a little bit and then around 14 or 15 some friends started a band and I I became the bass player in the band uh because nobody nobody else wanted to be the bass player so I was like I'll do it I'll do it <laughs> All right. And you had to move into Oregon, right? You went to school down there, right? Yeah. yeah, I wanted to I wanted to study more about music, which doesn't seem strange now, but at the time that was kind of rock musicians didn't didn't do that. But I I, I really wanted to learn um, more about structures and be exposed to more different kinds of music. And I had a, I had enough of a classical background that I could get into the university there. So I went to school and study composition in the university at the same time as being in uh, punk rock bands at the time. Wow, how you managed to do with the both? Uh, I just, you know, I did. I felt like I needed, I needed both. You know, I needed the yeah. the reckless thrashing and the the you know the rigorous uh, study. Right, got it. I, I imagine that at the time your parents, you were eighteen or so. I, I imagine that your parents knew you were an inclination for music and you were perhaps going to the music business into the music business any any pressure for your family it hey go to medical school go to forget about music you're not going to be make, make any money no, so no at the at the at the time uh it, it, it now now yeah you do that but at the time you could you know it seemed like you could you could be successful musician now for sure you have to have a second career <laughs> Or a first career, but at the time, no, no, they were very supportive. You know, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Because you can always, you know, you can always start again. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, in life, you need to take risks, right? Yeah. It didn't work out when you got your degree. You could teach. You could do other stuff, right? So it's yeah, yeah. It's not the other one. Uh, feel free to elaborate how you end up uh, meeting uh, Mr. Robert Fripp. I think you met him at the uh, guitar uh, craft. You yeah, went, you know when, you when I was uh, when I was um, in college and playing in punk bands and stuff. I I I I thought, you know, if this was three hundred years ago, two hundred, three hundred years ago, you would go and find the master musicians and say, "Teach me," you know, and hang out at their house and hang out in their backyard and their knock on their front door until they let you in. Um, and we just didn't do that anymore. And I thought, well, maybe I should do that. And so I made a, I actually made a list of all the musicians that I thought were, um, yeah. I should contact and, 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 and bug yeah. them. And when I made the list, there were a lot of great musicians on it, but Robert's name just kept going to the top. It was like, he could, you could learn something from this guy. You know, you could, you could, you could of course learn something from hanging around David Bowie or, or Peter Gabriel, but I, I had the feeling that they wouldn't be able to tell you what Robert could tell you. And then like right. two, two months later, I saw a little ad in Downbeat magazine where he was giving a guitar course. And I was like, okay, there we go. I'm going. Wow. That's, that's how I met him. Like uh, around in 1985, summer, late spring of 1985. Yeah. Uh, feel free to, how was the experience? Were you uh, very nervous? Uh, yeah, everybody was nervous. I mean, nobody knew what was going to happen. And, and, and it turns out Robert was playing it by ear to a degree too, to, I mean, he had a lot of resources, but he was, um, you know, going to respond to who showed up and, and, and how we worked together and what, what, uh, 
you know, what level we were ready to work at. Um, and uh, it was great. It was the first time I ever heard 18 acoustic guitars play one note in the in, in a circle in a, in a big ballroom. It's amazing sound. Yeah. Yeah, the opposite, the opposite of being in the university, complete opposite. Yeah, wow. You Looking back at your life, you ever thought that it, perhaps if you haven't responded to what asked or committed to go yourself to the course, you could perhaps would have taken another path in your life and would have worked with, with King Crimson on the road and, and you know, his the only wife thing and two years picture as if I had moved to LA like most of my friends yeah um I probably would have been in a a, a more successful band earlier <laughs> you know but uh you know that it's just a different kind of industry when you're when you're in the industry and and working with 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 Crimson and Robert it's it's um it's more our artistry and then industry if you know if you get what i mean like it's the 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 music isn't molded to the 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 marketplace whereas my my feeling of la was that you 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 know if i had moved there in the, in the late 80s i would have been in a big hair metal band that's that's that that's what was being successful you know or synth pop band or something um so i probably would have i don't know what i would have done who knows yeah, well, you know, the light, the, the stars are light somewhere in the world, and you went the right place at the right time. Yeah, yeah. Play, play with. I think I think your the first recording with, was with um, in 1991 with Toya, right? Uh, Ophelia's Shadow, right? So I, I I get a little confused whether it was that or or yeah. some all over the world, but I think I think it was that record. Um, yeah, I mean, I had made a lot of recordings on my own, but not not nothing pressed yeah. of us or CD yet. Yeah. Yeah. That one and and the the project with Robert and Toya Sunday all over the world were the the first bigger records I I was on. Yeah, you end up touring at the time after the two. Yeah, they were two. Both of them were in in nineteen ninety one. Yeah, we we so. toured a, a Sunday all over the world. We did a couple of little tours around Europe, um, England, and I can't remember Holland. Uh, and uh, then we 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 made the record and and the the project kind of ended. Yeah, yeah. So we did we did a couple of little tours. And then you felt that rapport with uh, Road Freak was good, and uh, you guys were getting along. He he remember you back in the day when you attended the course, or yeah. I mean, he kept asking me to be involved in projects. So the the next one was the Robert Fripp String Quartet Quintet, yeah. which was the three guys from the California Guitar Trio, Robert and myself. Yeah. And we played a variety of pieces, and including some Bach pieces, which were fantastic. And uh, that kind of evolved into uh, the project with David Sylvian. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Feel free to elaborate how you end up meeting uh, Mr. Sylvian as well. Because well, I never imagined I that. I mean, I, I, you know, I think they, Robert and David, had a, a special rapport when they when he played on the gone to earth record. Yep. And um, David asked him, must've asked him to do something. And Robert said, well, we should bring Trey. So I showed up, you know, our first couple of uh, writing, get to know each other sessions were David's apartment in London. And the three of us sat in his apartment for, uh, you know, three to five days writing stuff. And then they booked a tour. And so we did a tour as a trio. We did a couple of tours as a trio, yeah, uh, with no drums, and and it was fantastic. Really, really great. David was super generous and super uh, um, interesting, and he had a he has a different musical vocabulary from from Robert and I. So it was a great combination, and and uh, um, I, I I I loved I loved the stuff we were doing. Very unusual. Very very ambient soundscapes. And then we would play like 20 minutes of dripping, beautiful ambient soundscapes. And then, then David would come in singing, you know, after 20 minutes of this, you hear his beautiful voice come into the room. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was fantastic. Really cool. So good for you, man. I wish I had been in, in that room with you three. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a couple of bootleg recordings, but they don't, they don't capture it. They don't capture it. No. It's just, 
just flat the way you know the anticipation of like what's happening and he doesn't come out singing he didn't say anything you know really? like 20 or 30 minutes in then he brings his voice in and it you know it just makes the voice so special we would maybe do one or two little short songs and then these giant landscapes uh soundscapes yeah wow three great albums right so the first day yep. Darsham and Damage Life, which is the, the people that know the most, right? So Yeah, that's that's one of my uh uh for me that's one of my milestone recordings. I feel like that's one of one of the things I'm most proud to have been involved with. The the, the live record. I mean I love the studio record, but the, the live mm -hmm. record is pretty astounding. Yeah, the, the live that was done at the Royal Albert Hall, right? That's correct. It was. Right? It was yeah. the last night of the tour. We played two nights there at the end of the end of a long yeah pretty long tour and yeah. um, the sound was for us for me was terrible I could hardly hear Pat I felt like we weren't playing together very well I couldn't hear Robert very well and when I listened to the recording it's like wow we played really really well <laughs> yeah yeah the tour was um I think a Pat Bastelotto was also there and uh yeah I, Michael Brook I, I don't know Michael Michael yeah. Brook, uh, uh, Canadian guitarist, uh, producer, composer. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's involved in a lot of soundtrack nowadays. I think from, yeah. where, I, from where I read, and um, man, all these famous people you work, man, Martin Luther King. Feel free to you know any inside scoop into whatever you can talk here about. How is how David Silver to work with? Because David Silver for okay, I'm I, I wasn't there, right? So I'm. I know the folks for the music, right? So, Master uh, um, David Sylvia come across like a um, quiet, introvert, keep it to himself person, Robert Free with the other side, you know. He would be the director, the conductor, you know, here are the rules, very structured. How, you know, if you yeah, have asked me, have the two of them, how they end up working together? Well, they 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 had a, a lot of mutual respect, and oh, yeah. you know, Robert didn't did not um, take charge or take over. We kind of yeah. we kind of did it. You know, the, the we we made the record David's way, which is um, he's like a sculpturer. He's he's an artist, and he sculptures his records. Robert's more of a performer, so yeah. he would. Um, he would um, just want to play live, you know, just play, play. Like when we made the Crimson record, we did it in two, the Thrack record, we did it in about a week. We just played every song twice, two or three times each day. And that was it. Um, so that's how, that's how Robert worked. But David was more like, let's sculpt this. Let's, let's experiment with radios and voices. And, and, and so we kind of, did a performance we would do a performance kind of the way robert works and then david would sculpt on top of on top of that yeah yeah this is um yeah i have seen the videos and i have you know um cds of that album as well it's a it's a masterpiece i mean it's unbelievable mm -hmm. very good i do have you know, good, good, very good opinion of both uh, Mr. Fripp and uh, Mr. Sylvian, uh, both great musicians and yourself and Master Lord. And, you know, that was the kind of lineup from later on Kim Crimson in different albums, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so what happened after that? So, you guys did the tours in 93, 94, and then you we know, did a world like, tour with David and, and yeah. Robert and Pat and Michael Brook. And then, um, I can't remember. I I, I mean, I, the Crim Crimson must have been kind of being set up. Robert must have already been setting it up at the end of the tour, or maybe he just told me at the end of the tour, you know, we're gonna, I'm I'm, I'm I want to do Crimson again, and I want you involved, and and uh, so it pretty much, to my memory, it pretty much came right after the tour, or like three months later, we were, um, we were in Woodstock. Um, working with Tony and 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 Adrian, or maybe yeah, we, went, we went to England. We were in Woodstock, and then we went to England to work with Bill and 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 Pat. And yeah, I mean, it took a, it took a while to get it going because there were six of us, and we had to write. Um, there were some some ideas already flowing, but we needed more ideas. And and yeah, so we actually started out um, making this EP, this Vroom EP, 
was yep. the first thing we recorded, which is really the first time the six of us actually got together and played um, in, in Woodstock, New York, just down the road from where I am now. And um, we wrote and recorded that that little EP um, in the one in one week, I think, maybe two weeks. I can't remember. And then yeah. we then the idea was, um, let's go somewhere. Um, not Europe, not America, not Japan, Pan, somewhere kind of not in hiding, but somewhere where we could um, really play a lot of shows, play the band in, try some ideas. And then, um, you know, as you know, the, the, I don't know what it's like in Chile, but in Argentina, the, the economy and the government goes up and down a lot. And we yeah, happened, I'm a, I'm a, happened to be just then things were going really well. So, yeah. so we went down to Buenos Aires for a month and we played 18 shows in uh, Buenos Aires and La Plata and then Rosaria, I think, but, but, yeah. but mostly in one theater in, in, in Buenos Aires. And that's where we played the band in. And then immediately we, we flew to, uh, after that, we flew to um, England and recorded at, at Peter Gabriel's real world studios. And within two weeks, we pretty much had almost the whole record done. The Thrack record. The Thrive record, yeah, that was the one after the the EP. I thought we would go in. I thought we would go in and kind of do some of the sculpting like we had done with David, but it wasn't like that. We were we were done. We played, you know, we played down three versions of each piece, and there you didn't really need to do much to it. It was already the band had already sorted out everything on stage. Yeah, what memory do you have from Buenos Aires? Of course, I'm oh, I love it because I had been there. I had been there. Earlier with the Robert Fripp String Quintet, we played a, a several shows down there, and we had yeah. some friends from Buenos Aires. I, I, I loved it, and um, you know, I had as most Americans, um, United Statesians, I should say, because you guys are Americans too. Yeah. Uh, you know, we don't know what what it's like down there. South America, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh you know, it's like a it's a very old European style city. That's right. Yeah. And uh it was it was awesome and you know it was hard to go to sleep because everybody's out on the street at midnight and 2 in the morning and 4 in the morning uh but you know that's what we did. For sure you eat a lot of steaks and a lot of salad. Yeah. The yeah. The wine there, you know. A lot of mate. I still have my mate gourds. Really? You yeah, know, yeah. Wow. Yeah, where I live in New Mexico now, there's an Argentinian cafe down the street, and they serve mate. And so, I have I, I feel like I feel like an honor, uh, honorary South American as well. Good for you. Will. Well, if you're ever in Chile, let me know. I can I can show you. Around. I will. I want to go back to Chile. I want to go. I want to go down to Tierra del Fuego and, and uh, south, south. Yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I want to see it all, but I, I'd like to go. I'd like to go to the uh, observatories. And also in the north, north. yeah. And Chile, as you know, is very kind of thin country, skinny country, right? Very long. So yeah. the north is very different from the south, right? So you gotta mm -hmm. go to go to the south, you gotta go um when it's um winter here in the United States, right? December, January, February, March, it's summer there. So that's the best time to go to the south. The yeah. north you can go anytime, but uh, maybe maybe we can coordinate one day and I will I can I can take you a show is a place that uh, people don't know. How um, I, I read somewhere in in a, a couple of interview that and this is a quote from Robert Fripp saying, "Well, I'm I'm very strict. I'm uh, I'm a difficult person to work with. Uh, in general terms, how's how's the guy to? He come across that way, maybe, you know, because I don't I don't know him personally. I know him as a musician. You know, maybe the perception that I have is is very different for." for the way that he is he's well, actually he doesn't, he doesn't love doing interviews so so, yeah, that's, he doesn't, so yeah. you know so his his contact with journalists is a little more tense I, I, yeah. I never had any issues with robert we yeah, kind of yeah. we kind of um saw things music you, you know the the music kind of comes first and yeah. that that was an easy way to work and we worked i worked pretty fast and he likes to work fast um Mm. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I mean, I didn't. He has a streak. He has some rules, I suppose, right? And you know, it's a fast-paced environment, right? It's like a company. Yeah, I mean, his his way of working is is for himself. He doesn't really make other people work his way. Um, in, in the way I think people think, you know, I mean, you know, he works with Adrian, who's totally. They worked 
together for so long and Adrian's totally different and David Sylvian is different. I mean, David Sylvian's quieter and more personal, uh, yeah. introverted, but yeah, I mean, he's worked with everybody. Yeah. yeah. Good. How's to work with uh, Bill Brufer that end up retiring? I, 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 I love playing with Bill. You know, he, yeah. um, he's that kind of drummer that um, he almost doesn't hear music like a drummer. He hears it like a conductor. So he's, he's very aware of the, the, the big gestures of the music. And I, 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 I really appreciate that, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And he and Pat, sounded great together yeah good good for you feel free to elaborate a little bit of people that they don't know about the the, the chapman stick and the, the the guitar you play which is a combination of a bass right and a guitar. yeah it's it's uh it, it's, it's the, bass, the, right? the, the the i started playing the stick around 1987 which was kind of known because of tony levin the other guy in crimson who played it Correct. in the in the 80s band and also with peter gabriel and and, and other records and it's a it's an instrument that's got uh, bass strings and guitar strings next to each other. And you play it all by tapping. So you don't pluck oh, so okay. you yeah. all your fingers on it, like a, like a fretboard. And, and I specialized in it. as soon as I picked it up, I was like, okay, this is my instrument. And I played that for, for a few years. And then I met uh, a guy in California who builds me a custom instrument called the war guitar, W A R R, which is very, yeah, totally. small, but it has a body and it has a, a lot more bells and whistles and stuff. And so that's kind of the instrument I've been playing for the last 30 years. And it's very, uh, I, I do a lot of different things. It's very percussive, but it also um, can be very liquid sounding depending on how you process it. And you can play in the guitar register so or the bass register. So I like to be in, I, I really like being in projects where there's also someone else who can take the bass role so I can go up and solo or do textures and then go back to the base and yeah is it difficult to sort of master that particular instrument for someone who is like myself i'm not a musician i mean it, it has some challenges it has particular yeah. challenges for bass player and guitar players because because they think it's similar and it's not at all the technique is very different um it has some challenges but it's a new instrument so you know we're still all learning what it can do yeah you end up playing with um you know, with King Crimson for many years, different DVD, different Blu-ray, toured around the world, and then toward the end, I think at two or three, you end up uh, leaving, right? After, after I think it was the the Power to Believe tour, right? Yeah, yeah, that was the last um, yeah. the end of that tour in Europe. Well, actually, our last show was in Mexico City, um, <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah, and we, I, but for me, that was kind of like we're done and I, I'm not sure what Robert wants to do next, but um, it just wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't for me to keep, keep doing it. I've been doing it for 10 years and, and I, yeah. 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 At the same time you were, you know, you were developed as a musician and you wanted to do your own things that work with other people, release your own material that sometimes you couldn't do that as Cream Crimson, right? It's Cream Crimson. Well, so, I, you could, but you're, you're just so busy, you know? Yeah. You're so busy. So, and I had a child and I wanted to kind of um, just not be out on the road so no. much, you know? Yeah. It, 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 is it difficult to be a musician in the sense that, well, you you are away if you're a, if you have a family or have kids, right? You can, you can play sort of local venues, travel 20 cities and then come back home. You don't make that much money. Versus, you know, being part of uh, King Crimson or, I don't know, big stereos like Peter Gabriel or Genesis travel around the world and you disappear for six months. What, what's what's the balance? Right? On a way, right, you make more money playing in Wembley, right? Playing with uh, Peter Gabriel, right? Or Genesis, but... You would hope, you hope so, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I haven't done those, I haven't done those kind of tours, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, with Crimson, yeah. we were all, I was the youngest guy, like yeah. at, at 40. So we did very manageable, like three weeks here, go home for a couple of weeks, three weeks, you know, um, uh, these long tours, I, I don't want to do them. I don't want to do them at this point. And I didn't really want to do them then. I mean, the tour with David Sylvian was the longest I've been on, which is 10 weeks. And uh, yeah. that's enough. That's that's too much. The tour I'm on now is is almost five weeks. And 
I haven't done that for a long time. And, and, uh, yeah, it's, you, you want, uh, it's a balance, right? You, yeah. You, yeah, if you, you disappear, have... your wife will divorce you. The kids will not recognize who you are. Right. But you make more money. Right. At the same time. Right? I hope so. Not necessarily, but you hope so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it difficult to be uh, a musician, be the life of a musician in general? You know, you, it's it, there's pluses and, and minuses. You know, you get to the thing about the thing about being, about being the, on the road for a long time is the band yeah. gets really good, gets really tight. That's right. If you play and it every night. things get easier. Like uh, you're just able to just drop right in. It's eight o'clock. Bam! Now we go. You know, mm -hmm. when you do these little one week tours every month or two, it's harder to get. It's harder to get going. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you get to play music. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, uh, I'm lucky me. I see, like I told you before, right? I'm able to see a lot of shows. I'm, I'm very happy with that. But I'm, I'm not a musician. I, I go to a show. I play my ticket. You know, my drink a beer or two. I, have, I don't know if the band, the bass was late. They have a fight coming in. No, and you get and to go home to your own bed. Sleep, didn't, huh? You get to go home to your own bed. I have a, right. You you sometimes you wake up in like your case where I am in a different hotel. Oh man, that the bathroom is to the left, not to the right, like it was the night before, or I have a terrible night, sleep, you know, issues at home. You take a nap and then they pick you up at six and you need to be sharp at eight o'clock. People are just paying big money to see, I don't know, getting crimson or whatever, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's difficult. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, easy for me to say, but um, but it's it's a difficult life. I think. Well, we learn we learn how to manage it. You have to learn how to manage it. Otherwise, yeah. you can't. it doesn't matter about the money. You just won't be able to survive it, or you won't be able to. Um, um, you know, I was never in the military, but I think it's very. It must be similar. Like you're 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 at service to this thing, and you've got to go where you go, and you you have to learn to take care of yourself and learn how to when to relax and when to when to be on guard and, and how to travel, you know? Yeah, because some, I suppose that you can, you know, if you play on a Tuesday and the next week in Thursday, maybe you catch in a fly on Wednesday, but you can, can you see cities a little bit, recognize, you know? Not usually. Like off here not usually. I mean, I tried to, I, I try to like walk around at least between sound check and, and, yeah. and the show just because it gives me a feel for how people live in this spot, in yeah, you know, yeah. um, but usually it's pretty rare to have a day off where you're not driving all day or traveling. Um, yeah. Sometimes you might have a day off somewhere and you hope that you're somewhere nice and you're not yeah. stuck, you know, you're not stuck out near the airport. Um, I mean, I've seen stuff along the way, but it's usually because we've organized like a small tour, like we're going to Poland and we have three shows, but three days rehearsal before, yeah. you know, or 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 like that, you know. Actually, when I went the 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 first time I went down to Chile, one of our shows canceled. So we were in Santiago, and my buddy and I, um, we rented a little car and drove up into the drove up into the Andes for the day. So that's very rare to be able to do that, you know, because a day a day sightseeing is a day you could be doing a show somewhere. It's very expensive not to be playing yeah. there, right? Yeah, yeah. Still, money. you need to move the equipment there. The, the still, you need to eat and then play for the hotel and so forth. So it's yeah, yeah. Eat up the budget, if you will, right? For or, yeah. or so or, this or, like this project that we're on tour right now with Pat and and Marcus. We're yeah, playing almost. Uh, we when it, when you have a singer, you can't play too many shows in a row. Like some singers can do five shows in a row or four. The boys need to rest, right? Yeah. Uh, but with this project, we don't have a singer, so we're doing like seven shows in a row. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and so that's a, you know, I'd rather be playing. If I am if I can't go see the area, I, I want to be doing a gig every night, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So you can finish, come back home to your kids, family members, spouse, whatever, right? So you're starting the tour, I think, the 11th. Almost eleven in Goodstock, New York. Yeah, we play we play uh, uh, the show with Adrian and Tony on the eleventh, and after that, then Marcus and Pat and I go out as uh, Tuner is the name of the band, and we go out for another three yeah. weeks. Yeah, I've never been in the. I think it's called um, Bear Spills Theater. Bears, in, yeah, in, in Woodstock, New York. 
I, I heard they're very nice, they're very popular. A, a lot of famous band have played. Yeah, there. it's a famous old yeah. venue, and and there it's was a big venue. recording studio there as well in the, in the old yeah. days. A lot of records made there, and I played there many times. I don't know, a dozen, two dozen times. Yeah, you don't you don't live there to New York, right? You say in New Mexico. No, I, I was living in Seattle, but I, oh, I've Seattle. I've recently moved to northern New Mexico, is where I'm based now. I got it. Good, good yeah. for you. Man. Yeah. Feel free to uh, elaborate your collaboration with uh, John Paul Jones in the. Oh yeah, the, yeah. In so John, I met. That's another famous guy, man. Yeah, uh, David Sylvian's manager, and also who became Crimson's manager for a while. He also managed John Paul Jones. And so John would come out to the Crimson shows uh, when we'd play in London. And eventually he asked me if uh, I wanted to be in a project with him because he has a similar um, a similar musical role as me, which is he's a bass player, but he also plays a lot of other instruments. So he kind of yeah. needed a band um, with somebody like me that could play bass or solo. And um, I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And the first thing we did was he invited me to to play on his first record, Zuma, which I went down yeah. to LA and played on it. And then it just didn't work out with the schedule because I was out on the road with Crimson. I couldn't do the live shows with him. So he he had uh, the stick player, bass player, Nick Beggs, who plays with a lot of people, Steve Hackett and Steve Wilson. So Nick did the tour with, with John. And eventually that band did a double bill with Crimson for a tour. So I got to hang out with John. John's unbelievable. The, the secret we weapon of, of Zeppelin. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know Paige gets a lot of credit and of course he's amazing, That's... but, but yeah. John wrote all the string arrangements. He conducted the strings. He played yeah. mandolin. He played organ. He is an all around super rounded musician and he just keeps going and going and going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you say that because no many people would know that. You know? No, no, he, Maybe you know, he's got a bass course. player mentality, which is kind of you hold it together and let everybody else shine, kind of. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I he first invited me over to his apartment in London to meet and talk, and he had his played amazing piano for me. He had his, uh, I don't know if you remember the 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 triple neck acoustic guitar. That he played with Zeppelin with mandolin and guitar. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Was there. It. He's like, you want to play it? I was like, I don't even want to touch that. I'm too. I'd be terrified to pick it up. Um, he played pedal steel, lap steel, all sorts of instruments, yeah. and composed. You know, he composed like he was one of the top yeah. bass players at the time, uh, session players in London. But he also did string arrangements for Donovan and worked with McCartney, and he was uh, all over the place. Yeah, right. yeah, really talented. Yeah. yeah, I think like 20 years ago, you ended up uh, founded a, a multimedia group, Quidia. I think. Yeah, uh, which is that was one of the Quidia. That was one of the projects that we brought down to to Chile and Argentina. Yeah, and yeah, Mexico. yeah. Um, all right, man. Took it all around the world. Yeah, yeah, and I think in 2012 you played with uh, Jerry Jerry Marot as well, right? With the, yeah. The yeah, I had a I've had a project with Jerry for about eight years. Uh, we call it this call it the security project, and the idea was that we would play all the old Peter Gabriel music from the first four records that Peter yeah. doesn't play anymore, and play it really well. And we did it was really really great. Yeah, I think Jerry's. We're at the I'm at this camp right now. I don't know if you know about this three of a perfect pair of crimson camp where we have 120 people come in and. And we do workshops with them. Adrian's here and Tony and Pat and Marcus and Adrian's band. And so uh, they do that every year. And I, I've been out here and teaching this week. And I think Jerry's coming out here maybe tomorrow. I don't know. I'll see him. Or in Woodstock. We're just up out, up in the mountains above Woodstock. Oh, well. And then after after the after the Friday gig, the three of you split and start touring. Yeah. That's your trio, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, man, great musician there, Tony Levin. Of course, Tony yeah. will be hanging around a couple of weeks, and then he will need to join Peter Gabriel for his yeah. tour here in the I'm going to be seeing him like uh, three or four times. Oh, that's right, they're coming to the states. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh man, I can't wait. I saw yeah. them in Europe, in Italy, a couple uh, two months ago. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Oh, excellent. You know, of course, right. I love Genesis. The Peter Gabriel, it's the show is very different. You know. 
his latest album is different, like, to say the least, right? But uh, but it's great music, man. Yeah, man. And I, I only I know you 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 are short on time, so I have only a couple of questions uh, left. I think you on the playing a little bit with um, Steven Wilson in the Grace for Drowning. It's a second. Yep. I played on that record. Uh, I think Pat was involved with some of the production of that or something, yeah. but Pat was Pat, maybe Steven had, had sent one track to Pat to do a, some yeah. stuff on. And so I played on that and uh, that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Seems any, to be times. Yeah. Any, any looking back in your life, any, any, in general term, any regret thing you would have done differently or. You know, the only, th not really, I just, um, I feel like I, I, I've discovered something about um, hearing and developing my ears in the last five or seven years. And I wished I had discovered that 40 years ago. That's the only thing where I feel like I could have been a way better musician if I had figured out how to, to train my ears earlier. Uh, but, you know, when you discover something is when you discover it. So how did it happen? I mean, how? Uh, it's something I've been looking at for years and years, and uh, because I felt like my ear could be better than it than it than it is, and then I finally just came across a a, a method, um, and I kind of kind of developed it. For the, the the problem with a lot of methods is they're based in uh, certain styles of music, and my style of music doesn't quite fit with jazz or classical, so I kind of had to um, like study study this kind of ear training but then develop it for my develop practices within my own style of music yeah okay. and i would love to, i would i now i teach it to mm -hmm. to musicians and i'm trying to get like please just work on this you'll be so happy you did <laughs> you know yeah. i wished I, I wished i'd had it 30 years ago but it's not a regret it's just you discover something when you, you would have been about it, but still you're you know looking back yeah. at your life man you're playing you can play with people from Led Zeppelin, uh, Porcupine Tree, of course, Stephen Wilson, and with Robert Fripp, uh, David Sylvian, the best of, you know, now you're hanging out with Master Lotto and Tony Levin and uh, Andrea yeah. Bidou, and the best of the best. So you, hey, it ain't that bad, you know? I'm not complaining. No, no, I'm not complaining. And there's still more to come. Yeah. Well, you have a good attitude. You know, you have a good personality and uh, you're eager to keep on working, learning, you know, travel and touring. And so it's good for you. Yeah, there's still so much more to explore. For me, it's about exploring and being curious. And I, I don't see that going anywhere. You know, it means it means kind of being uncomfortable because you're always going into some some new thing like this project with Marcus and Pat, the tuner. Uh, our record is completely improvised. So we just improvise for five days. And going on stage completely improvising is uh, really it's terrifying. it's terrifying. Yeah, it's great, but it's terrifying. But you, so you, but when you say improvise, you have you know the tracks and you know when somebody no. starts in or, no. or it, nothing. It really improvise. Nothing. We don't know anything. There's no song. There's no nothing. Yeah, we just start. So if I, if I see you three nights in a row, they're going to be completely three different shows. Well, we have we have some pieces. A a base, few pieces, right? But in between the pieces, there's improv that that we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, good for you. That's the best things. Yeah, you know? I think so. I think so. I love it. Yeah, good for you, man. I know you are short on time, Trey. It was very nice talking to you, man. And uh, good and luck you to you. Well. Hopefully, I will see you in a couple of days, and we can uh, take yeah, some pictures. Yeah, come to Bearsville. And, uh, come to Bearsville. It's going to be packed. It's usually completely full. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing. I need to take some um uh, uh King Crimson CDs and vinyl for um Tony and uh Master Lotto to sign and some of the stuff for you as well. Like, and Mike Reuters. Very very good people. Very good. Very was very nice talking to you, Trey man. Good luck awesome. to you and hopefully I will see you in a couple of days, man. Awesome. Good luck with the tour, man. Thank you, Claudio. Hey no bro, take it easy, man. Thank you very much, man. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.